Okay, now our next speaker is Dr. Libby Char, is someone I met through her parents who have attended the mini med school. In fact, her mother, Evelyn, is here today and is a member of the class. Where are you, Evelyn? Let's give her a hand. <laughs> it's quite apparent that you did an excellent job. Okay. Now, Libby has extensive experience in emergency medicine, something we hope not to use, but if needed, is critically important in saving lives. She gave you the written part of her talk, but today she will talk story with lots of pictures. Please welcome Libby. Thank you. So I just want to say uh, before I get started that that last speaker, Dr. Clyde Shee, he is a fantastic surgeon and he is a superb teacher. And I was always fortunate when I got to operate on cases with him. He's just top-notch guy. You won't find a better guy. Okay, so today I thought we'd talk a little bit about the 911 system. Um, extremely stressful time if you ever need to call 911 or you need to use the emergency medical services system. And so I thought maybe if we could educate you a little bit as to how it works and what happens when you actually call 911, maybe that'll kind of bring your stress level down a little bit during a really trying time. So I thought we'd talk a little bit about it. You know, when you, when you call 911, who is it that's answering that phone? Where are they located? Where does that phone call go? How does the information get conveyed? And how do they decide who to send to your house or to wherever you are? Um, what kind of training does that person have? Who's answering that phone? What, what do they know? What can they do? Um, and then, how does the whole package work together? Anybody ever call 911 before? And who did, who did they send to your house? Or who did they send to you? It was the police, okay, who else? Fire, okay. The ambulance. Anybody ever have more than one agency respond? Very commonly, right? Okay, so when you call 911, the first step is that it goes to something called a PSAP, or a public safety answering point. And these guys, their, their job is to answer the phone, 911, do you need police, fire, or ambulance? So they're asking you. And you may say, I, I, I don't know, uh, there, there's been a car crash. So how do they know who to send to you? And what they do is they, they have a system like an algorithm, and their sole job is to figure out where do I take this call and send it? Do I send it to police? Do I send it to the fire? Or do I send it to EMS dispatch? So they will always default to the medical first, so if there's a car crash, they'll say, is anybody hurt? Well, I'm not sure. Okay, that's fine. They'll send it to EMS first. And the nice thing is that nowadays in our sophistication, we'll get into this a little later, we can have EMS and fire listening at the same time, seeing that call as it unrolls at the same time. So that's their sole purpose is to figure out where do I send the call, police, fire, or EMS. They also can send calls to ocean safety lifeguards and they can send calls to the suicide and crisis line and to the poison center. But primarily it's those three, police, fire, and EMS. As you can see, there's a, there's a room here and there are four 911 dispatchers. So there's usually four people on at any given time to answer these calls. And oftentimes this is the choke point when you call 911 and they say all the lines are busy and all that kind of thing because there's four people here. These guys get over a million calls a year. And this is only for Oahu. This is not statewide. So you can imagine what kind of volume they're dealing with here. They get two months of training, because essentially it's how do I recognize what the need is from this caller, and then how do I get the calls there? So it's a two month training, and they're separate from the police department. So these are the four people on duty here. You can kind of see them. And I took these pictures in December, so that's why you see all the... They're, they're not year-round into all these decorations. So where are they located? They're actually in the police department. And you see up here on the second floor, you guys recognize this building? So up here on the second floor, 
is the communication center for the police department. And they're way at this end, uh, at the diamond head end of that room. And they're all the way at that end, and you could see they're kind of against the wall there. So that's where they're physically located, but they're, they're separate and distinct from the police department. Okay, so what about these guys? Well, we kind of said they're in that same building, right? That entire second floor, with the exception of that little bit at the end, it's all the police communication center or police dispatch. It's quite massive. So this second floor again, all of these windows here, um, all the way down that building, it's all the communication center. This is the room. So I'm standing by the four 911 dispatchers. Look at the size of this room here. Just to kind of give you a sense of the, the scale and the order of magnitude. So the police communication, they get close, they're approaching that million. They get the majority of these calls for sure, about 880,000 calls a year. At any given time, they're broken into eight districts around the island. So there's a dispatcher for each district. And then there are what we call the call takers, and there's between 12 and 20 of those on at any given time. So just to run the police communication center, remember there are four 911 dispatchers, there could be 30 police dispatchers, which makes sense because now they have to actually talk to you and get a lot more information. Each call takes a little bit longer. These guys do a year of training in order to be police dispatchers. And it's primarily like an on-the-job kind of training, because you can imagine it'd be really hard to set up a, some kind of didactic for them. So they, they do have didactic training, but for the most part, it's a one-year situational training. So what the call takers do is they take the call, you know, police department, what's the address of your emergency? Tell me what's going on, you know, what do you need? And they try and get all that information, and they figure out where you are, so if I figure out that you're calling from Hawaii Kai, I say, okay, that's District 7, um, and then I'm going to pass that call to the District 7 dispatcher. Now, we could have a whole bunch of calls coming in all at once in Hawaii Kai, so now I need to prioritize which call goes, the dispatcher is going to handle first. Obviously, if there's something really serious, uh, a life threat, then they should take that call first and send police, versus, you know, I can't find my... my my house got broken into, or something along those lines, where it's, it's a little bit less time sensitive. So they have a pretty complicated job. And as you can see from these slides here, there are several screens, several computer screens. And you'll see this over and over in all of the dispatch centers. It's a pretty complicated system where there are a lot of multitasking going on. And so you see screens that have uh, geo maps on them when the call comes in as well as who's available and what units are on calls. You get a whole bunch of different keyboards here just for that one person to deal with. And this mapping thing is an interesting thing. When you call 911, if you call from, who still has a landline in their home? <laughs> See, I think you guys are in the minority. I do. <laughs> I absolutely have one because in a disaster, the cell service is gonna be bombarded and it's gonna go down. But a lot of people nowadays don't have a landline. They just have cell phones, right? If you call from your landline, I, as a dispatcher, can see your address. It'll pop up automatically. Even if you have call blocking or anything like that, it'll pop up. So I'm going to verify that that's the address. Um, we can do something similar with cell phones, but not quite as good. So keep your landlines. <laughs> it'll, not only does the address pop up, but the sophistication nowadays is it'll automatically pop up on a map. So it's kind of like I Googled your address or something and it pops up. So it kind of gives me a sense of where you are, if it's a residence or if it's a business or something along those lines. So this is just another screen here. And you can just see all the different computer screens that they use simultaneously. I think that's why it takes a full year to train one of the dispatchers. Um, so here's the actual dispatcher for District 1, which is downtown Honolulu. That's this gentleman sitting here. And then you see he's located next to District 6. And it's not that the police department is bad at math, but they're trying to, to locate them geographically. So District 1 is uh, downtown Honolulu. District 6 is Waikiki. 
And so because they have adjacent areas, and I think the handoff is somewhere around Atkinson, where it changes from District 1 to District 6. So that way they can physically lean over and talk to each other if they need to. So this is a map showing the, the various districts. And what I think is remarkable is you see the size of Wahiwa district here. Because the density is not that much compared to Waikiki here, with the extremely high density. So it looks like a very uneven map, but it actually is quite reasonable when you look at the division of work and the number of calls and whatnot. And again, 880,000 calls a year. That's what these guys are dealing with. So this slide is to remind me to tell you, this, is, this person is doing that one-on-one -on -one training. This person is being trained, and they will sit for an entire year with another dispatcher to be able to take a dispatch position solo. The other thing this reminds me of is, you see these windows here? Remember we saw them from the outside? This is the second floor of the police station. So these windows are all hurricane-proof. They're bulletproof. Um, because in time of a bad storm or something, you don't want your communication center to go down. So it's a safe place. Additionally, they have an alternate uh, dispatch center uh, down on the other side of the island. And every month, they'll do a check of that alternate station. All these dispatchers will go down to that alternate site, and they will dispatch out of there for three days. And what it does is it allows computer folks or whoever needs to, to come in and work on the dispatch center here and upgrade things or, or do whatever they need to do, clean the place. And it also makes sure that that alternate site is up and working. Because if you think about it, you have this alternate site, it's kind of like the flashlight in the drawer that you never use. And then when you need to use it, you turn it on and it doesn't work and the batteries are dead and you're scrambling for batteries. If you checked it every single week, you know it works. Okay, we have the fire department here. Where is the fire department dispatch center located? Wild guess. Kaka'ako, okay, good guess. Iolani Palace, I know, I, I, I knew I'd get that answer. I faked you out with this. <laughs> Wouldn't that be awesome to go to work at Iolani Palace every day? Any other guesses? Frank Fossey Building, Frank Fossey building exactly correct. In the, In the basement. So the fire guys get about 75,000 calls a year. So remember, the, the 911 operators are getting a million calls. Police are getting about 880,000 calls a year. Fire's getting 75,000. Huge orders of magnitude and different. Of these fire calls, a lot of them are just kind of heads up notice, so they're not actually responding a fire apparatus, a fire engine company, or something like that to it. They're just receiving these calls. So a lot of them are, um, when buildings are going to test their fire alarms, they'll call the fire station and let them, I mean, the fire dispatch and let them know so they don't think it's an emergency and send. Uh, really common call, which I've been surprised, is how many people deal with emus and fires. So they typically will call before starting this big emu because, you know, all that the smoke and the steam coming up, people call 911. So you got the guys that do it regularly know to call and warn um, that they're going to be doing an emu or fire alarm test, all kind of things like that. So when you actually distill the numbers down, the fire department is dispatching someone on the order of 50,000 times a year. 53,000 calls are generating sending a fire truck out. Now, interestingly, in this day and age, 75% of all of the times that you're seeing a fire truck roll, they're going to a medical call. Think about that. So yes, we still have fires. We still have car crashes. We still have building fires, structure fires, house fires, things like that. But I think with the building codes and the materials that we use and the safety systems that we have in place, we don't see as many fire calls, thankfully. Um, because the complexity certainly has gone up. I'm sure everybody here is familiar with Marco Polo. Um, but the complexity has gone way up as the density has gone up. So thankfully, because of all the building codes, we see less. And that's why it's a huge deal. And the fire department is fighting really hard that whole thing about sprinklers and buildings and retrofitting and whatnot. And it's a big deal for them because it, it does impact their work. So we're going to 39,000 medical calls per year, and that's the fire department. 
well, what is a firefighter going to do for you at a medical call? Certainly don't want them spraying water on me. <laughs> so what can the fire guys do for you? CPR. Absolutely. So they can, they're EMTs, they can do CPR. So we have an interesting thing in our state that there's this level of training called National Registry of EMT, Emergency Medical Technician. So since about 2001, all the incoming firefighters are certified to this National Registry EMT level. And we have a difference in our state. In most states, that's good enough you can work on the ambulance. In our state, we have a higher level that you're, that's needed before you can work on an ambulance. So these guys are all National Registry EMT, but they're not of the level where they would be working on an ambulance. But they certainly can provide basic life support. Life support. These guys are the masters at CPR. And I think some of it is because fire and ocean safety have a smaller toolbox of what kind of medical things they can do. They really have perfected those few things that are in the box. So CPR is absolutely one of them. And more often than not, they're first on scene to any kind of CPR kind of case. And they're first on scene and they're doing CPR before EMS gets there. All of the dispatchers in the fire department are firefighters first. So just like at how, say I'm a firefighter, I would put in a bid to go work at you know, the Hawaii Kai Fire Station or the Waianae Fire Station, or I want to go work on the rescue truck. Um, they put in a bid to work in dispatch. So they're all firefighters first. And then if I go and work in dispatch, that's a, about eight months of additional training to be able to do all the dispatch things. So this is where they work out of. You named it exactly right. It's a Fossey Municipal Building, you know, City Hall, and it's in the basement. So way down in that basement, there's a door that looks like this. And when you knock on it and you go inside that door, it looks like this. It's a small room. There are about five guys on duty at any given time. There's a captain. So just like any other station where there's a captain and then there's the, the folks that come under him. So there's a captain on duty and then there's usually about three or four others. And we'll take a look at one of their screens. Um, and then we'll see that it mirrors kind of what we were seeing at the police station where there's the, the geo mapping and then all the other screens that they have to deal with. So why do they send fire when you called for a medical problem? Well, we said they're EMTs. And we also said that they're the masters of doing things like CPR. There are 43 fire stations. At any given time, that truck is probably in quarters. And there are how many ambulance stations? Wild guess. 14? How many? 16? OK, so there are 43 fire stations. At any given time, the chances are that that fire crew is in quarters. There are 21 ambulance units. And at any given time, the chances are that they're on a call. So if it's something like CPR, it kind of makes sense, huh? If you have other people that are well-trained in it, why not send them, let them get on board and do life-saving things, and then EMS can show up, and that way we have a system. So everybody thinks of EMS as an ambulance, but it's actually a system. And we even have police involved in that now for CPR and things. Um, as of a couple of years ago, all the marked police cars have an AED in the car. And we work with the police. Um, we help train them as well so that they can do CPR. I think it's not a priority for them like it is for fire. So their level of CPR training is, is not quite as robust. But they absolutely have that AED. And they can get there. And they can start doing CPR until fire shows up and or EMS. So we have 43 fire stations. Most of them have a single engine company, so there's one fire truck in it, and it's an engine, and that's the one that has the capacity to pump water from the truck. Um, we also have multiple companies. So in some, especially in some of the west side stations, there may be a fire engine, there may be a ladder, there might be a rescue unit, a hazmat truck coexisting in that one station. So we call it multiple company uh, stations. So altogether, there's actually about 70 fire apparatus. And they're split amongst 43 different stations. Does that make sense? 
Okay. Each truck has a captain and has an engineer that they call the driver, and then there's usually one or two other firefighters. So on a ladder truck, because there's the guy sitting in the back that wants to, that, that's got to be the coolest job. I want to do that one day. <laughs> but they sit in the back, right, and they, and they drive. So there's five people typically on a, on a ladder company. Um, and then on the engines themselves, there's usually four. Sometimes it's tight. Sometimes there may be only three guys, a captain and two others. So they have to make do, and that's why you see multiple fire trucks responding sometimes. And there's two hazmat units. And those guys would deal with any kind of chemical spill. I smell gas. You know, I think there's a gas leak somewhere. Um, sometimes it's a matter of somebody spraying weed killer, and then the schools are calling because the kids are getting nauseated. And so these are the guys that go and check all of that kind of stuff out. But remember, all of these guys are basic firefighters first. And then we have two rescue companies. So one of them is housed at um, next to Don Quixote down in that area, Poa, and then the other one is out on the west side. So they try and split them up so that they have better coverage and faster response. So this is a screen in the fire dispatch, and that island map shows the different battalions. The, area, the island is split into five different battalions. Remember in police we said there were eight districts? So for fire, it's broken into five big chunks. And all of those listings on the right of that computer screen are all the different trucks and apparatuses, and it tells you whether they're in service or whether they're out on administrative leave or whether they're on a call or whatever. So it's what we call a system status board. So the dispatchers know at any given time, I can't send these guys because they're busy doing something else. Kind of hard to keep track of 69 different trucks, huh? So this is a single person screen. And again, you can see the, the geo map in the upper right corner here. Um, traffic cameras are very, very helpful sometimes. Here's the system status board. Um, these are other maps that they use to look at which apparatuses are available. This is who's on a call right now. Where are they located? Are they en route somewhere? Are they on scene? And all of these times are tracked as well. So when they send somebody, they mark the time. When that unit says we're responding, they mark the time. That unit says we're on scene, they mark the time. So we have a pretty good log of everybody's activity. So again, this is, the, this is the map that shows up when you call to place you to see where exactly that call is coming from, whether it's a residence or a business or something, because that'll affect how many companies that get sent, right? Single family fire, that might be some resources. If it's in a building, obviously, I'm going to send a whole bunch more. OK, and then we have these guys, emergency medical services, or the EMS folks. So we already said they have 21 ambulances, right? So where are they located? So the dispatch is in Queens? OK, good guess. Not exactly. Good guess, though. So where is the dispatch center located for EMS? Honolulu Airport. Oh, you guys fall for my bait every time I threw you off. So this is, this is the airport, and this is the airport dispatch. And they used to be located in a room way up here. And it, we used to call it the cave, because it was all dark and squishy and everything. And it was a horrible place. So now they're located where I'm standing, shooting that picture. You ever drive to the airport, and you see that weird building with those ramps that go up that looks like it would fall down, it looks like it defies gravity? They're in that building. It's the airport industrial complex. So EMS gets about 90,000 calls a year. So fire is sending on, they get received 75,000 calls, and they're dispatching on about 53,000. Police get about 880,000. EMS gets more calls in fire, significantly more, 90,000 calls a year. Now, a lot of these are repeat callers, because if you're driving by on the freeway and you see a big crash, you may call on your cell phone, and I may call, and you may call, so we might get multiple calls. And that's OK. Don't assume that somebody else called. Because the other thing that does is if I get one call that there's a traffic crash somewhere, as a dispatcher, I say, OK. But if I'm getting five calls, I know that there's something there. And it's pretty significant, so maybe I'm going to send a little bit more resources or say, and I, I'll tell my crews, I have multiple calls reporting this accident. 
so they know kind of a heads up what to expect. All the dispatchers on Oahu have state EMT licenses. So they're all either EMTs or paramedics, and they have to have at least one year of experience in the field running calls so that they know what's on the other end when they're dispatching. They know who's listening and what's important to them and what's significant. And it's really, really helpful. And that's a higher standard than other islands. Um, on Kauai and Maui, the dispatchers are civilians, and they dispatch for police, fire, and EMS. So that's a tough job. But I think our guys have a little bit higher level of sophistication because they're all state licensed EMTs and they all have a year riding on the ambulance answering those calls. All of them have what we call EMD training. Um, they're all EMD certified. And so on Kauai and I think Maui's trying to get there, their dispatchers are also EMD certified. And what this is, is it's a three day course that they take. Um, and we'll, we'll, I'll show you an example of what it looks like. But the EMD certification is sort of an algorithm so when the call comes in, what questions are significant? And based on that answer, what level of resources do I send? Is this something that's minor and I can send an ambulance without lights and siren? Or is this something like, well, this could be really bad. I better send the cavalry. So this is EMS dispatch. It's about the size of fire dispatch. It's a room at the airport industrial complex. And there are typically four or five dispatchers on at any given time. And usually one guy is dispatching and the others are the call takers. And you can imagine some of the calls might be a little bit more complex and a little bit, uh, have, takes a little bit more time to gather the information that you need, the pertinent information. So this is one dispatcher's screen. And you can see they have one, two, three, four, five, six different computer screens here, three keyboards. Um, and they're talking to the caller, it's all recorded lines. Again, you can see the geo mapping here and here. This is, this is who's on what call at any given time of those 21 units, where they are. So somebody's en route to Queens, these guys are at Kuakini, they just dropped off their patient. These guys are en route to a cardiac arrest call at this residence. And so that's what all of this is, and it takes two screens to do that. Traffic cameras, again, can be very, very helpful. And then you see this little thing here? It says EMD protocols. We'll get into that in a minute. So the EMD protocols are all computerized now. But like anybody, computers go down, right? Or we have glitches or the system's down or something like that. So they have these actual flip chart books. And it used to be a flip chart where they'd sit there and depending on the call, chest pain, I'd flip to that card. And that's how we used to do it, and it was all handwritten. So nowadays what it is, it's all computerized, but this is the kind of the flip chart. And you can see they have a... So when you call 911, 911, do you need police, fire, EMS? Oh, I think my, my coworker just passed out. Maybe he's having a heart attack or something, I don't know. Okay, stay on the line. They transfer the call over to airport industrial complex. Paramedics picks up the phone, or the EMT dispatcher, and they say, ambulance, what is the address of your emergency? Because what they need to do is they need to verify that they have the right thing on the screen. And then as soon as they know that, they're sending a unit. So they may keep you on the phone to ask you a bunch more questions. Don't freak out, they're already sending somebody. That's why that's the very first question. So ambulance, what is the address of your emergency? Can you verify that, please? Because they want to ask it twice. What is the phone number you're calling from in case I get disconnected or in case my ambulance crew has questions on something, I can call you back. And then is the patient conscious? That's the next question. And based on that yes or no answer, then it moves into a couple more. Is the patient breathing normally? Because it's not just a matter of is the patient breathing. There are different kinds of breathing and there's one we call agonal breathing. It's kind of like they take a gasp every so often and then they don't breathe for a while. And then they take the gas, and to us, that's not breathing. We call that agonal, and that's not gonna last for more than a, a couple of minutes. So we treat that as no breathing. So ambulance, what is the address of your emergency? Can you verify that, please? What is the phone number you're calling from? Can you verify that, please? Help is on the way. Is the patient conscious? 
Is the patient breathing normally? And based on those answers, they have this book, and it gets really complicated, which is why it's a three-day course. So, okay, I take that complaint and I look, and it scores it and tells me whether this is an emergency or ask a few more questions, and maybe it's not, you know, and I can send somebody without lights and siren. So it gets into these complicated algorithms. We don't need to understand any of that, but you should know that the first question they're going to ask you is, what is the address? Because people always get upset. Why are you asking me this? Why are you asking me my phone number? Just send the ambulance. Well, we need to know where to send it, first of all. <laughs> and I would like your phone number so I can call you back if I have more questions or if we get disconnected. Okay. So that slide is to remind me to tell you about this. And this thing here is what we call uh, Web EOC. This is a board that you, we have in EMS, and we have it in all of the hospitals. And it's actually a statewide board, but especially for Oahu. And this lists every hospital. It's really hard to read it on there, but it says Queens Medical Center, status, open. And then it'll say Castle Medical Center, status, open. It may say Kuakini Medical Center, status, divert. And it's a list of all the hospitals that are open. That's this green column here right after the name. Um, or it might have more instructions along here, like, okay, I'm at Queens, and my hospital's open for business, but my CT scanner's down. And the reason that makes a difference is if, I ha if, if I'm transporting a possible stroke patient, I need to go to a place that has a CT scanner. So it gets a little bit more complicated. So when you're calling me, and I'm, say and I'm dispatch, and they say, well, we're going to take this patient to Queens, uh, stroke patient. As the dispatcher, I'm saying, oh, wait, 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 Queens is on reroute for CT scan. You should go to this place instead. So you can see it's like herding cats sometimes. It can get kind of complicated trying to keep track of that stuff. But you absolutely want to be accurate because you don't want the patient to go to a place where they can't get the best, most expeditious care for what, what their issue is. So we have 29 EMS units. And since this slide was made, we've added a couple. And again, just like fire, remember that Waikiki was at, or for the police, Waikiki was that tiny little district? So look how many units are in town here. And then there's one out here, uh, one in Kaawa, one out in Haleiwa. And if you look at the call volume, we're trying to balance the number of calls and the distances involved. So by right, if we just did it by numbers, there would be no ambulances in Haleiwa or out in Kahuku, because they just don't get that many calls. But can you imagine if you called 911 and I'm trying to send somebody from Pearl City to get out to Kahuku? Forget it. Game's over. So that's why we try and balance between putting resources that can respond in a timely fashion but I also don't want to just do it geographically and say, hey, that's not fair. We only have two ambulances on the North Shore. And how come you have so many units in town? Well, the Kahuku ambulance might go to a couple calls a day, maybe three calls a day, maybe four. My town units might go to 30, 40. So it's, it's all about trying to balance that resource, yeah? And because it has to do with time and distance, it, it's not an easy, it gets kind of to a messy equation sometimes. But we, that's how we try and do it, is to, to balance it. Okay, so I get to your house, and I say, where do you want to go? And people are always surprised by that. We, we absolutely, number one, we try and honor the patient's request for where they want to go. So we have a few rules in place, but within that parameter, we can generally accommodate where you want to go. So if you say, I want to go to Kuakini, unless Kuakini's on divert, probably I can get you there. All the town hospitals are kind of equidistant. What if you're in Hawaii Kai and you say, I want to go to Kaiser? Can I do that? Is that reasonable? Well, again, it depends, right? So if it's 7 o'clock in the morning, <laughs> sorry, we're going to a town hospital, right? Because I don't want to wait 
the 40 minutes or whatever it's going to take me to get there if there's something time sensitive that's going on. So we will go to a town hospital. What's your second choice? Now, if it's 2 o'clock in the morning, that might not be so unreasonable to get you to Kaiser versus Queens or Coquini or Straub or something. Right? So it really depends. And that's why some of this is, is more complicated than people appreciate, I think. Um, what if you're on the windward side of the island? Well, now with the advent of H3, I can get you to Kaiser. That's pretty quick. There's no stoplights there. So we always try and honor the patient's wishes to the extent that we can. Unless that hospital's on divert, or unless there's certain critical things, like if you were an OB patient and you're going into labor and you say, I want to go to Kuakini, well, that's probably not a good idea because they don't have OB services there. <laughs> right? So in that case, we, we transfer it. So the way we codify all this is we say the closest appropriate hospital. If you're a trauma patient, there are a few exceptions. Even if you're on the North Shore, if you are a significant trauma patient, we will bypass all those other facilities and go to the level one trauma center at Queens. Because that's where you need to be. And going anywhere short of that is really not going to be that helpful. The one exception is if you are in uh, cardiac arrest. So you could be a bad trauma patient, but if you're in cardiac arrest or you don't have an airway, I as a paramedic could not establish an airway, you're not going to make it to Queen, so I might divert to the next closest. And if they can then get that airway for me, or they can do something that they need to do and get your heart beating again, then yes, I'm going to pick up and I'm going to haul and I'm going to go to Queens. So it's, a, it's the closest appropriate hospital, and it's oftentimes based on the patient's request. So you're at home with your loved one, and something happens. Somebody falls down, gets a big gash on their head, and you can take them to the hospital. We will take you along also if you wish to. So we can take one person, usually, and we'll put you in the front seat of the ambulance. You can't be in the back patient care compartment because you can understand how that could go south really quickly depending on who that family member is and how they're reacting to all of this. But we will let somebody come along. We'll put them in the front seat, buckle them in, and they can ride to the hospital. Know that when you get there, though, how are you guys going to get home? That's one thing. Um, but, you know, the other side is that you're with them, and do I really want you at that point in time trying to drive your car through traffic to get to the, to the hospital? And what if something happens, I end up changing destination, or, you know, you're stressed out, the last thing I want you doing is trying to drive, or God forbid, you're trying to follow me. <laughs> That's not a good idea. So we will take a family member, but just one, and we'll put them in the front seat. They can come along. Okay. So en route, they have a radio system in the ambulance that they can communicate with the hospitals. Just about all the hospitals on this island, at least all the receiving hospitals. So they can open up communications on the radio um, and speak in real time to a doctor. We call that online communication. And they can open up online with just about anybody. And for certain um, situations, they're mandated to open up online. So for a trauma, they better call and let me know that they're coming. And I want to hear what they're bringing as well so that I can get ready on my end. This is really key nowadays for things like uh, certain kinds of heart attacks and strokes because I can get my team ready and before you ever hit the door, they're standing there ready to go. You show up at Queens, we knew you were coming, we knew that you're having a certain kind of heart attack because they can transmit the EKG I got the cath lab up and open and waiting for you. When you hit the door, you go straight upstairs. We had that artery open within 20 minutes. And that's, that's not unusual. And so that's being done at most of the hospitals now for, for what we call car, uh, coronary, percutaneous coronary intervention, or PCI. But we have to know which hospitals can do that, because we don't want to take you to a hospital that can't do that if that's what you need. Um, similarly, for certain kinds of strokes, I want to, you know, I got to get that, that blood vessel open. Every minute of delay, you're losing a million neurons. So even a couple of minutes can make a big difference. And that's why it behooves us to know which hospitals have which capabilities. And if today you don't have that capability, then I need to let my crews know, my dispatchers better know, so they're not sending people there when today is something's going on, the cath lab's down, or whatever the case may be.
So you can see that it gets kind of complicated. Well, that's online medical direction. We also have a thing we call offline medical direction. And there's a thing called the state standing orders. And it's a booklet of, of orders that normally they would need a physician to give the paramedic permission to do, to administer a medication, to you know, do certain interventions. But they can do this. They have like a blanket permission ahead of time for certain of these things, especially things that are really time sensitive. So for example, in a cardiac arrest, of course we're gonna have CPR going, but they're allowed, without even talking to me, go ahead and, and put in a breathing tube, go ahead and administer certain medications, and then when you get to this point, far into it, then you can give me a call, because I don't want to slow them down. And so that has to do with a lot of training up front for the paramedics. It's probably why paramedic school is about a year and a half long. But they have this book of standing orders that they're allowed to use, and also, these work if they can't communicate with me, um, there's a dead zone, they could, the radio couldn't get through. Um, we all have cell phones, so they also have cell phones that they can call the hospital if the radio is not working. But in the event that they can't use any of that, they at least have their standing orders that they can use. Uh, billing is a question I get very frequently. So you get a bill for an ambulance and your eyeballs are popping out because you're going, oh my god, it costs a lot of money. So typically, your insurance company should cover a good chunk of it, and there's negotiated rates and all. Where does that money go? Does it go back to the ambulance folks? City and county? Interestingly, we are the only state with a statewide EMS system. So just like education, you know, usually education is based on counties and municipalities, right? But we have the State Department of Education, so we have a statewide EMS system that was created in 1974. If you go to the state EMS office, there's like five people there. So what they do is they subcontract in each of the counties. And so they gave dibs to the, to the county, and so on Oahu, city and county EMS is the 911 provider. And they're what we call a third service, because there's police, fire, and EMS, and they're all separate departments. On the big island, it's fire-based EMS, because they're firefighter paramedics. And that county chose to solve it that way. So when you call 911 on the big island, you get a firefighter paramedic. On Maui and Kauai, either they, the county couldn't do it or didn't want it, and so it went out for bid. So there's a private company, AMR Ambulance, that provides 911 service on Maui and Kauai. All of the revenues that are generated by EMS go back to the state general fund. So there's a lot of controversy now about, well, should the counties get some of that? And who's responsible for the funding? And you know, how do you incentivize the counties, and there, it, it gets complicated, obviously, but there's a lot of discussion about that. So all of the money right now goes back to the state general fund. The state EMS system costs about $80 million a year, which is actually a pretty good bargain when you look at some of the other, I mean, the fire department's budget alone is over $100 million. So statewide EMS is about $80 million. The revenues generated from ambulance billing is about $45 million a year. So you're getting an $80 million system, and it's costing the taxpayers less than half of that. I think it's not an unreasonable situation. But all of that money goes there, and it's a California billing company that's contracted. So that's the other thing people are freaking out. Like, I'm getting a bill from somebody with a California address. Is this legit, or is this a scam? So that's what it is. It's a mainland billing company. All goes to the state general fund. Okay, so here are our responders. That these are our choices. You call 911, one of these guys is going to show up. If the police show up, they have the AEDs, we talked about that, and they can do CPR, but they're not otherwise medically inclined. Uh, fire, they're all National Registry EMTs. They can do basic life support, not invasive things, they can't administer drugs, but really good CPR, they have oxygen, they can splint, they can extricate. Um, they do fantastic CPR. 
EMTs, the state licensed ones, work on the ambulance, and the state licensed paramedics work on an ambulance. The paramedic level can actually administer certain medications. They can do invasive procedures. If, you're, if you have a collapsed lung and the chest is blowing up, they can put a needle in the chest, and that can be life-saving to let the air out. Um, lots and lots of things. In our country, doctors are not responding on the ambulance. That's not the same in Japan or in Germany where they might put a physician or an anesthesiologist or something on the rig, but that's how it is in our country. And I think it's because our paramedics are so well trained. So what does the future hold for us? Does anybody recognize this? See this patchwork brick building here? This one over here. Anybody recognize that? It's another mystery building. So I'm standing on top of the Honolulu Police Department uh, at Baratania Street. This is actually on the top, right adjacent to it is like a little park. And I'm looking back towards the ocean. And that building with those goofy things, I don't know if you recognize it from this side, but now I'm standing on uh, King Street. And this is Alapai Street and City Hall is over here. And this is going to be the Joint Traffic Management Center. So it was funding from the Federal Highways, a grant that we received. And we started building it in 2008. Um, I had to look that up. And it was supposed to have been completed in 2018. Um, and then I guess the city wouldn't sign off on it because there were like building leaks or some kind of issues with it. So whoever built it is kind of going back and trying to fix those things. And then it will open. And that's going to be a neat thing for us, because that's going to house police, fire, EMS, and ocean safety dispatch, all in the same room. And the value of that is, if there's a multi-casualty incident or any kind of disaster, we're all right there and we can talk to each other. So a couple other things for the future, the way forward. Um, we now have computer-aided dispatch. That started in about 2013. So I, as an EMS dispatcher, can see the exact same screen as a fire dispatcher. So remember we said the call defaults to medical. So as the medical guys, I'm hearing this call, there's, a bad, there's been a bad car accident, two people are hurt, one guy's bleeding, I don't know, he's lying on the ground, it looks like his leg's broken. I can pick up a, what we call a J line, it's a direct line, I just pick up the phone, it goes to the fire department, fire, you see that call on your screen? Yeah, we need a call response. Fire says, got it, we're rolling an engine to that scene right now. And then I hit over to the police. Police, you got that? We're going to need police. There's a bad car accident. There's victims involved. So they'll block the traffic, clear the way, whatever they need to do. So that's one of the things now that computer-aided dispatch has, has been really helpful for us. Joint Traffic Management Center is going to be huge to have everybody co-located. Um, what if you're a deaf person? How do you call 911? So, so last year, uh, 2016, we started something called a, a text, text 911. So it wasn't well publicized, and I think that's because they wanted to work out the bugs, but you can actually text 911, and you will get somebody to answer you back. And then they kind of translate it, and, and it goes in. So they're still working on making that a little bit more robust. Um, cell phone, if you call from a cell phone, we can't get your exact location based on that number, but the cell sites will triangulate and it will tell me where you are based on that triangulation. It's not perfect, but we can usually get it, like say if you're in a neighborhood, I can narrow it down to maybe a, two or three houses as to where you're calling from. It's been real helpful out for beaches or a crash on a highway where people, they don't know where they are. So that's been real helpful. Um, and then finally, there's a, you know, right now EMS talks on the radio, they talk to the hospital and that's all, and they can go back and forth on the radio. Well, wouldn't it be nice if I call, ambulance gets on scene, okay, it looks like the guy's having a heart attack, take a picture of the EKG, send it to the hospital. We can transmit the EKG now, but send it to the hospital. Hospital knows what's coming in. They can activate their cath lab or their team or whatever. They're ready before you ever show up. So they hit their something, at, automatically notifies all the people on the cath lab team that day. OK, 
okay, well, our cath lab isn't working or we're a small hospital, we're calling 911 again because we're going to need to, we've stabilized them now, he needs to go to hospital number two. But I can reach back and I can get that EMS communication and everything because I'm involved in this case. I'm going to send it to hospital two. Hospital two can go back and they can see the lab values. They can see, they can even listen to the communication from EMS on the way in. They can see that initial EKG. They can see the one from hospital two when they did a repeat EKG. And most importantly for us in EMS, I can go into that chart and pull the outcome of this patient. And that's huge for education and learning for me to do my follow-up. What happened with this call? What were the good things? Where could we improve? And what was the final diagnosis? Oh, he had an occluded left anterior descending artery and they ballooned it open and this was the before and after picture. Great. And guess what? That technology actually exists today. We don't have it in our state yet, but things like that exist. And so I think healthcare with the composite of technology, it's getting a lot more complicated, but it's also getting a lot more interesting. And the capability that we have is phenomenal. So with that, I hope that'll kind of allay your fears. At least you have a little bit better understanding of, of the system. You know that a fire truck's responding to your medical emergency because they can help provide basic care. And if you have to call 911, you be patient with the guys on the other end of the phone uh, and stay on the line until they tell you to hang up. I'd be happy to field any questions. I have a question that I've asked several people about, and it has to do with uh, people that have advanced directives and have do not resuscitate. I'm told that when the fire people get there, that they're required to resuscitate even if they have that. I'm going to pay you because that's like the greatest segue ever. <laughs> so EMS cannot interpret advanced directives. They can't sit there and look at a legal document. They're not trained to do that. But there's something called a POLST form. And I don't know if anybody has seen this. I'll pass around one on each side. And POLST form is a provider order for life-sustaining treatment. The nice thing about this is you can say, if my heart stops, just allow a natural death. I don't want you to do CPR on me. I don't want you to put a breathing tube in and all that. Or you can say, I want you to do everything if my heart stops. So it's all about your choices. EMS is allowed to honor this and honor your wishes and make sure your wishes are carried out. Now, it's not just for EMS. It's also for a hospital. But box A is for EMS and for firefighters. And believe you me, they look at this and they ask the family whether there was a post form. Post forms are not for everybody. Everybody, well, Ken Zeri taught me this. I can send you the, them the website too, because I know where to get them. Who, who's going to live forever? <laughs> okay. So for those of you who are not going to live forever, you should have an advanced directive. Because that kind of says your philosophy on what's important to you in life and what kind of th things philosophically you would like or not like. So everybody should have an advanced directive. Who should have a post form? Ask yourself, would you be surprised if this person died in the next year or two? Would you be surprised if the person was still alive in the next year or two? <laughs> so for those people that are, you know, getting to that point in their life for whatever reason, those people should have a post form and EMS and fire absolutely can honor those post forms. And you fill it out. It doesn't need to be notarized or anything. It's signed by you and it's signed by your doctor. You can Xerox it. You can do anything. We ask people to have it available. It can be on white paper. It doesn't matter. But I absolutely, if you know people that for whom that is reasonable, please, please, please fill out a post form because that's one of the few things that EMS can honor. If not, and you say, I have an advanced directive, I have an advanced directive, paramedic, they will say, that's great. And they're going to run the code anyway, and they're going to do CPR and try and do everything. They'll call the base station physician and say, this is a situation, is it okay if we don't? But in the meantime, fire and everybody else, they're going to be doing CPR. 